Good day, this is Brian Kayla, PhD, and my PhD stands for Post Hole Decker, where I continue to work on the restorative justice for the prodigal son. And that means very simple, that we need to deal with some oxymorons, compromising positions, the body of Christ's compromising position. You see, that it has been a secret for a very long time. We were looking at the wrong place. When I look at the body of Christ compromising position, that means as well that we need to be able to prove that there are issues that are contradicting. And one of them is, when I love the Lord, I do what the Lord says, not what I want people to do. And I find and discover more and more and more, the longer I got exposed to the law, that my mind changed and my ideas and my philosophy changed and that is what we're dealing with today a compromising position that the church puts itself in is indeed very sad the worst part is that the majority of people don't even recognize it Often when I think about the matters that we are discussing about the body of Christ, it is related to a lot of political mischief. We have a fellow in the White House of the United States that is complying with no rules whatsoever other than his own rules. He wants to restore Christmas and for that favor he got the votes from the majority of Christians. I say the majority because lots of people are now realizing so much something is amiss. A man that is soaking on his thumb because he is not re-elected, because he failed to do a proper job, couldn't care less about 3,000 people a day dying. 300,000 people are dead in the United States. And I know that normally out of 320 million people, you always have a couple of million people dying. At least 2.8 million people throughout the year die because of accidents, diseases, heart attacks, or what have you. The regular things that we deal with in life. But when you get a pandemic, what do you do? See, blaming the president is not fair. The president is in a worse position because he took on a responsibility. He did not realize how big that was. But what I am concerned about is those that know who he is, that they don't understand that what they are doing is called enabling. And an enabler is worse than the person who is acting the deed. In other words, being an enabler puts you in a position that you are as much or more responsible for the deeds of that person that you enable. And that is the concern I have because I was raised a believer. And the body of Christ, the way they act at the moment, with prophecies after prophecies that God will restore a man that's a liar and a cheat and whatever he is. I don't want to go into that because that is not my business. But what is my business is the, the body of Christ because they believe that they are following Yeshua HaMashiach. Most of you folks know him as Jesus. But what is the reason that I keep on hammering on restorative justice? Let's go and find out what we truly mean with restorative justice. What is the concept of restorative justice? Well, some of the people realize that restorative justice is not a name very well known. Restorative justice happens to be well known in and around prison. In North America, it is a daily subject. When you get involved in a court case, usually there is somebody that got offended and that there is an offender. If you are the offender, that means you have either stolen something or damage something on purpose or by accident. There is a judge that will figure out 
what it was. If you did it by accident, you can't help it, then the damage might be negotiable. But if you did it on purpose, purpose or worth, worse, if you did it because you were mad and you were not going to kill somebody, then of course the judge will be very serious about the matter. So now it comes down to whatever it is that made you enter jail. You become a convict. You are now in maximum security or in medium or minimum, depending on what your sentence was. You are inside. And in order to settle the damage done, there are different ways of dealing with the damage. One of them is very simple to discuss with the inmate and the victim. Now, many times that is not possible. If the person is dead, then you have to deal with the family. If the person is not dead, then you have to deal with violence that sometimes the person, the victim, is not ready to deal with. And so a pastor or a rabbi or a social worker will be able to maybe start restorative justice by having conversations. And this is what I'm doing today as well. Having conversations, opening up the seed actually of, hey, I did not know that. Because restorative justice was something that was already in the Garden of Eden available. See, many of you don't know that what I went through opened my eyes. For a long time, I thought I knew it because I'd been raised a Christian, basically born a Christian. I ended up at school, in Christian school. I went to seminary, then to Bible school. I worked at a Bible school, practical Bible school. And then I, I preached during that time for 12 years as an evangelist, initially in Europe and then all over the world. And then ending up in Canada, living there, becoming an, an basically an individual that worked in motivation, but also inspiring other people, till I made a big mistake. And that mistake was saying no to a friend of mine who happens to be the head of the Freemasons. At that time, all I knew was he was Freemason, big deal. But when I said no to him and turned him down in a business transaction that was generating for me millions of dollars and was worth billions, my friend warned me. He was going to crush me. He was going to make my life so sour that I would regret ever to deny him. And that is where I started learning the concept about the law. Because in his position, he had a lot of lawyers as well as people that were judges, people that in the police and others in his pocket. I didn't know it at the time, but when the judge threw it out the first time and the second time, they brought it to another district. They got it in under another story. And of course, after 18 years in court, 12 years actually without lawyers, I was sentenced for six years. Not only I, but my wife as well. But the point is not what happened to me, what I learned in the process. Everyone likes to cry, but why would we cry about spilled milk? It is what I learned in the process. See, in 1981, when I moved to Canada with my wife, there was another law that came into play. Pierre Trudeau's father was there, and he was the prime minister, and he signed the agreement of the Charter Rights and Freedom. I remember that I used to have a very nice big sheet hanging on my um, office uh, board because it was important. I'd never really read it nor studied it. But when I got challenged in court and I was no longer allowed after spending $10 million on lawyers to have another lawyer, I decided, okay, then I'll learn the law. And as I learned the law, and we had only a very short time to do that, I was forced to speed read. I was forced to read and think completely different than I used to. And that meant that I had to learn what precedence was. I had to learn what it meant to have evidence, proper evidence. And also to deal with people that were lying in court and how you dealt with lies. And through that learning process, although I was not looking for it, I won on appeal. 
In other words, I lost first. The first case I won, and then the Crown brought it back on appeal because he hated losing to a person that was not even familiar with the law, let alone Canadian law, and English as a second language. But the beauty was, when the process started for the real court date, the judge said six months for trial. If you kill somebody, normally you get four, five, six days, ten days in court. I got six months with my wife and it was ridiculous. Every little thing that they could throw at me, they threw and we lost the case. But you know what I learned over that 12 year period that took 12 years before we got the six months trial. In 2012, February, I got sentenced after I'd been inside for five months. And I was locked in a cell with the enforcer from the Hells Angels. And there were some other names thrown at me, uh, banditos and the stories I heard. People were scared for this dude. But you know what? I had a little secret. My secret was, I know the Lord. And God had put us together because every night this guy couldn't sleep because whatever he did in his life, the sleep was taken away, but prayer would bring him back and I would pray with him. And together we became friends over the five months that we were in that cell and on that range. He got sentenced, I got sentenced. He got two years minus one day, that meant he was provincial. I got six years, that meant I went federal and I went to maximum security. But in the process, something happened in his life as well as in my life because I needed to learn the law. You see, what is the compromising position, the Christian oxymoron, is that at the moment people are told certain issues. You believe them. The same like I believe them. Like everything in my business I did based on what I was taught. I was taught if you uh, invest with someone and he is a brother in the Lord, you pray together. So we pray together and I was challenged in court because I did not sue the people that I had invested the money with, although they came in front of the judge to confirm that they had received the funds and Revenue Canada acknowledged them. And everything was confirmed. I got still sentenced because the deal did not go through. And I learned to take responsibility Although some of it did not make sense, I learned to check what is reality, what was the evidence. And this is how I discovered, although I hated to admit it, that I had been deceived. I was a Christian oxymoron because a Christian is a follower or a person that is praying to Serapis, the God of the underworld. Oh, oh, that is an oxymoron. You are claiming that you're a Christian. That means that you're claiming that you are not a follower of the way, the truth and the light. You can have fantastic meetings. You can have prayer meetings. You can do everything under the moon, but you are missing the boat, my friend. And I'm sorry to tell you, I hate it to admit it, but like I did in court, I accepted the fact that when I lose, I lose. Let me work on a pill. Let's see how we get out of this mess. So the challenge that we have is what is the truth? Now the truth is very simple. There is only one truth. Okay, so it doesn't matter how big the story is, whatever you say. There is something that I wrote about that for 1500 years, the real story was not shared in the churches. And the body of Christ's compromising position is a Christian oxymoron, because how can you be a Christian and a follower of the truth. So when I learned that there was a special vault in the Vatican and they had over 53 miles of shelving, 53 miles of shelving folks, and it's all catalogued, 12 centuries worth of documents. 
housed in one of the most iconic bastions of religion and culture ever. The Vatican's secret archives are the stuff of historical legend, but their existence is real. So during the holiday season are the living scriptures, a Christian doctrinal dilemma, or do we treat them as a flexible mirror? See, if you have a mirror that you can just turn around and etc., you don't care. Then you don't care about the truth. So everyone has a good intention, but when they jot down a note, it will be organized, you think. A useful note and a clue that what is going on on earth is worthwhile talking about. But if you write it in shorthand and you don't remember what nonsense you wrote, the next week, it is very hard to discover. So we have to check out and find out what is the truth. Now, the truth, Pilatus asked Yeshua that same question. It is an important question. What is the truth? We seem to always want to know the truth. When I listen to anyone speak, I want them to tell the truth. When you are in front of the judge, he said, do you promise to tell the truth? and nothing but the truth. Yes, sir. And you have to swear on the oath that you will be telling the truth. So what is the truth? Because spiritual talking, we wonder what is the truth? So in John 8, 31st to 32nd, if you continue in my word, then you are my disciples and you shall know the truth and the truth shall set you free. Psalms 119, 142. Thy righteousness is an everlasting righteousness, and thy law is truth. Now, recently we talked about some discrepancies. For the longest time, anybody that has money. So in the old days, if you were a knight or a person that was rich, that means you were a buyer and a seller, you had money. There has always been a difference between the two parties, the public and the riches. So who were those rich folks? And, you know, you wonder what in the world is going on. So with the agriculture, if you were a farmer and you got a skill and you developed speeds in getting your seed in and out, in the Stone Age, they didn't know much. So carefully we see wealth improving and there is an elite dominance always it was loftiest group domination of crucial information in other words the people that were smart they had a name they were pharisees or priests or they were princes and they were special people and for the longest time the simple people they could not really read so questions continue about men made beliefs they appeared the obstacles without fail it is always a problem somebody knows something and they want control over it and when you discover they corrupt the ideas violating man-made doctrines what are we talking about if you do not follow the original gospel teachings of the way the truth and the light what do you do so contrasting the promise of Yeshua, I will make known unto you deep and mysterious things, modifying and a range of long-held beliefs while living in a state of unconsciousness. What I'm trying to say here, folks, is for the longest time you have been following a group of people. They were tough. They were great. They were men of God. They prayed and miracles happened. But it is full of baloney. I have prayed with many people. I have laid hands on people. I have seen healings. But you know what? It was not according what God wanted us to do. When we read 1 Kings 2, verse 3 and 4, and keep the charge of Jehovah, thy Elohim, to walk in his way, to keep his statutes and his commandments and his judgments and his testimonies, as it is written in the law of Moses, that you may prosper in all that you do and whatsoever you turn yourself. So whatsoever you touch is, that will be prosperous. That Yahweh may continue his word with 
he spoke with me. If thy children take heed to the way, to walk before me in truth with all their heart and with all their soul, they shall not fail because they shall be successful. Folks, the law of truth was in my mouth. Malachi 2 verse 6. And iniquity was not found in his lips. He walked with me in peace and equity and did turn many away from iniquity. In Psalm 85 verse 11. Truth shall spring out of the earth and righteousness shall look down from heaven. Isn't that an awesome, precious verse? The same truth that looks down from heaven will also spring forth from the earth. Wow! Who could that be? Jesua, of course. Jesua claimed to be the truth. But now that we know that the meaning of truth is, what is the laws and the commandments of Jehovah? What are they? His teachings and instruction that set us free and that have now been manifested in the flesh. Well, when will the body of Christ review its double standards and clean up their mess? I worked in a practical Bible school with a man that was used by T.L. Osborne. He was a translator, Johann Maasbach. And I respected the man very much. And I was somebody there that was doing everything, whatever needed to be done to help, to get things doing, uh, moving. And I was brought up in a certain way. T.L. Osborne, Robert Schambach, people that were used, millions of people know them, all over the world. Unbelievable. And when I was facing reality, whatever I believed was tested and pulled apart in front of a judge, I started to recognize something. What is the truth? What is the truth that I stood on, that I believed in? Folks, what is the truth that you are living your life on? Are you just following your pastor or your pope or your priest or whatever person you are following in your life? You say, well, I'm a nice guy. I'm a nice person. I don't kill anybody. I haven't been in jail. No, folks, but you're living a lie. And the worst part is, you know it deep inside. You're not happy. Why is that? Because the life, the law was planted to reward the children of light with healing and abundant peace, with long life, with the fruitful seed of everlasting blessings, with eternal joy in the immortality of eternal light. Or did the followers of Yeshua HaMessiah, did they allow the Trojan horse, Christianity, that captured the true followers of Yeshua? Some of you know him as Jesus. Folks, those were the questions that I started thinking about when I was pulled apart in front of a judge over a 12-year period, every time, at over 400 hours of meetings in front of judges. And what I discovered was always go back to your evidence. So Amazing Grace, in 2017, Pope Francis orders Vatican Archives to reveal God's name Ending centuries of secrecy. It turns out that the Vatican has been sitting on archives, books written in Aramaic, the old Hebrew style. And when I say old, you got to recognize something. When God speaks, he speaks in power. He speaks in a whole different dimension in you and I. You and I, when we talk, we usually, we know, when we describe a house, the contents of a house, we can say, well, it is so many meters high, so so wide, and the measurements. And then we get a cubic meter. Or we can say, well, it's a triangle, and we can discover, and we can discuss what we need to cover the triangle. And the same for a circle, for a cube. We are dealing with the truth of God, and God speaks in a 12th dimension level. In other words, when he speaks, he speaks with power and might. And when he created paradise, Adam and Eve, he gave them one instruction. 
do not touch the tree of life. And why was that so important? When Satan came and took away the relationship between Adam and Eve and God, God had a plan, a restorative justice, whereby the creation of God would be made complete because God's word is law. You cannot break that. Adam was created for eternity, not to die at age 20 or 5 or 4. He was created for eternity. And we read that people die. We know that we die because we have pandemics hitting us and people are dying. So what is restorative justice going to do for you and me? When we get to know the truth, we will understand what the true relationship is supposed to be between you and God, me and God, you and me. In other words, how we are supposed to live. Because once we understand the power of God and the truth, we do want to live according God's laws. And there is a very simple way of doing that. It's called repentance. When we repent and turn around, it is not nothing wrong with being wrong. We can turn around and repent and say, Father, forgive me and be a prodigal son that goes back to the Father and the Father will be willing to receive you like he did me. And I tell you, my friend, there is nothing better than the love of the Father to understand the true value of truth, not the fabricated one that was created in 325 AD by Constantine, the emperor of Rome, with the, at that period a man that was appointed pope with all the power and all the lies that come with it. Yes, folks. Christmas, I don't want to say too much about it, but I would urge you, if the Pope ordered the Vatican archives to open and certain books came about and a friend of mine, I call him a friend, got a hold of a Aramaic book that he translated. It's a very difficult language to understand because they are thinking in a different way at the level of God. And he took years to translate it. And when I got a hold of that book, I started to recognize that we are not living the way God intended us to be. He wants us to be successful. He wants us to be healthy and strong, not killing and dying ourselves, killing each other because you think different. He has more money than me and therefore I have to destroy him. See, that is what my time in court showed me. I was not better than the other person because I was raised in the same environment. All I had was a name, Christian. And that was even a fake name because I discovered that the Christians were people that were after the Lord of the underworld. They were praying to Serapis. Um, if I tell you too much, it might be too much. And therefore I would suggest Take a look at some of the other videos that I've made. So far I've got about 250 different videos trying, sharing little pieces because if it gets too much, it is too much. But if you can digest it, how do you eat an elephant? One piece at a time, one bite at a time, okay? And this might be a little bit much for you, but I hope sincerely that you wake up and smell the roses because you can have peace. You can live with the truth once you understand the truth. God bless you. And remember, tough times never last. But tough people, they do. Amen.